Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started on this session. I'm Rick Luce. And I'm Carl Grant. And uh, I, I want to begin just by saying we've already, um, my chief technology officer and I, have had a bit of a, a dialogue back and forth even over the term makerspace in library. I think this is, has a, suffers the same limitations uh, if you're talking to a scientist and you're talking about applied versus theoretical science. It doesn't quite connotate perhaps the field one is working in. So, so with that, let me dive in, but, but ask you to think about what we're talking about slightly broader than the literal make, uh, makerspace uh, definition. So I want to start by just very quickly highlighting what, I, what I've received uh, from my provost, what all the deans have received as essentially provost goals. So everything we're doing, we're trying to tie back to the provost goals to make sure we're spot on in terms of alignment organizationally. So we, we're focused on student success, we're focused on faculty impact, we're focused on community impact, and we're focused on the brand equity of the University of Oklahoma. Pretty straightforward. I have to be able to rationalize everything we're doing and tie where we're going strategically back to this. I think it's actually pretty easy to do. We developed our strategic document in advance of the provost, but it, it maps pretty well. We have a couple key, what I call pillars, that we're trying to align ourselves to. The first, I would say, is really try, trying to transform the physical and the virtual spaces and experience of the research library at OU. The second is to take advantage of some extraordinary special collections and really bring those to life. Thirdly, to, to, be, to aggressively support campus research and data stewardship in the institution. This was invisible several years ago, and so to really rapidly wrap up an effort uh, in that regard. Fourthly, to chart a new role for the library and the institution in terms of um, creating some synergies there to enable new forms of scholarly communications. And then we'll do that through th uh, strengthening the skills and capabilities of, of our organization. So everything, again, we're doing fits under that category. That lines up to the provost, um, and, and everything is good. We've had some activity going on in the last couple of years. I've been at uh, the University of Oklahoma just about uh, a hair over three and a half years now. Uh, Carl joined me after I'd been there for about uh, six months or so. This is a, a photo of our new collaborative learning center. So physical renovation, another um, photo of the new collaboration center. I'll have to say, when I arrived at the university, my president shared with me his nightmare, which was, I worry that before I leave, or shortly after, that students will simply stop coming into the library. Um, we've been able, uh, we've dramatically been able to change that. It's now the, it's the activity hub of the university, as it should be created a new uh, digital scholarship laboratory, primarily for faculty and graduate students. Um, with the physical spaces has obviously come the need to fill that with human knowledge. So we've had to recruit new skills, new people, uh, and talents, and, and then bring digitized collections into these spaces. So that takes us to uh, the innovative, uh, innovation edge. Uh, or iEdge for short. This is again one of the new spaces. It's a very, very small space, uh, maybe an eighth of this room, very, very small, but an example of one of the new kinds of projects that fits under uh, our transformation initiative. So the, the space is located in our, in our main library on the main floor. Uh, it's a combination of maker space, fabrication space, classroom, um, seminar room, uh, it's a laboratory in, in many ways. It's a showcase in some ways of a new kind of work, of creative work that we want to draw magnetically students into the space. So it's got, it's got glass, it's got the kinds of things that students as they walk through the library are just sort of drawn to what's, that, what's the vibe going on over there. It's an experimental space. So when I think about laboratory, for me, that's a connotation always of a place to experiment. This is very much a place to experiment with what we're doing with software uh, and, and interacting with faculty, interacting with students, and so forth. And we're continually programming, um, partly through a, a matrix of library professionals that spend some time in that space and partly through student volunteers who are programming classes all the time. So students can come
come in and, and learn how to do a variety of different things uh, as a way to, to build engagement and activity in the center. It's open to everybody. Um, it's been swamped with undergraduates. Uh, we're, we're attracting in a variety of ways faculty members to come in. We've had a program to get some of the, all, in fact, all the deans eventually into the space. I've been bringing donors into the space. Uh, and so it's been very exciting to, to show them sort of where the new library is moving. So why, why innovation at the edge? If we think about our roots, where we come from, clearly books, manuscripts, paper represented the way that knowledge was embodied. Uh, there are tools for creating and, and conveying knowledge. Uh, and now we need to think about how a library building and space and digitized materials really do the same kind of thing. So innovation laboratories, in many ways, are just another embodiment of a space and a function, a utility almost, that creates uh, new forms of knowledge. And so that's what we're, we're really trying to extend an understanding uh, through our community with this. Why innovation at the edge? Uh, there's a quote from ACRL. Uh, but, but really the idea of bringing this activity in, into the library. If we think about a learning center, um, that would span the gamut of everything you do from solitary study through collaborative work, everything you do from theory to application. So, so pretty obvious, I think. What are some of the tools used in the space? And I'm going to hand that uh, over to Carl and ask him to, to pick up the thread there. Yes, maker spaces frequently have all a wide range of activities. However, we've kind of focused our space on the visualization and the pieces that support visualization of information. So we teach microcontrollers. We've got Arduinos and we run classes in these and we have uh, all kinds of sign up uh, for this class and people show up. And so they're, they're learning how to use these things. They're learning how to program them. Uh, it's very low barrier to entry. It's low cost for us to provide. We have instructors that uh, sign up and, and help us run these classes. Uh, and it supports reproducible research. So we're teaching, particularly undergraduates, that this is part of how we teach reproducible research. Building the circuit, being able to document it in order to show this is what I did and I want to be able to give you the capability to reproduce it. We do a lot of 3D printing, obviously, because this is an obvious piece of visualization. And so we've got a number of different types of printers in there. We found the lull spot to be much better than the maker's maker space <clears throat> and again that's for the physical expressions of virtual information uh, I like this quote I thought it was very appropriate we're working with NASA quite a bit because they've uh, been very intrigued by some of what we're doing I'll show you why that's the case in a bit but I like the, the statement that 3d prints and visualizations reveal important previously unknown information and provide a new means for conveying complex ideas. Uh, and that certainly seems to be true. So we'll show you a case of that in a little bit. We also have an <coughs> informatics person in the lab. So one of the things we do there, uh, we've contracted with our IT group. He's actually normally paid entirely by grant money and he's assigned to grants, but we have purchased 20% of his time to support informatics on our campus. And what we're really aiming at with this gentleman is to focus on those people that are 80% of the researchers that aren't dealing with big data sets. They're just trying to do their projects and their research, and he's there to assist them with their IT needs. Uh, we find the challenge on our campus, and I'm sure it's not unique, is that many times these people go to IT. IT is talking about mega data bits and sizes and information and programming and they don't really accommodate the needs of the small researcher. So that's what we're trying to do with this guy and so far this has been very successful. We also became members of Software Carpentry Institute. Have you all heard of Software Carpentry Institute yet? If you haven't, be sure to find out about it. It's a great program that's going on and it teaches low-level programming skills in very compact courses. Most of these courses can be run in two days. 
We've got a number of our team now certified by Software Carpenter Institute. We became a member of the Institute. We can be certified as teachers and instructors. And so we have a wide range of librarians and IT people that have now learned to become Software Carpentry <coughs> instructors. So they can teach courses and they can help instruct others uh, in how to become instructors. So uh, this has really been cool. It, you can go to their Software Carpentry website and you can find all about uh, they've got a number of workshops that they offer that we, we can uh, repackage and, and offer out. Um, we have a place on our website where people can go and sign up for courses, and so they do. Uh, they just, we, it's open to the public as well as our faculty and staff. So people sign up. Uh, we have everything from kids show up to researchers. Um, it's great. And they all learn from each other. It's really rather fascinating. We've also just stepped into the world of data carpentry. They branched out Software Carpentry Institute and are now doing what's called data carpentry, which has been dynamite. Uh, because again, what we're teaching researchers is how do you do data management? How do you do a data plan? How do you file down all these details? And they have a whole host of workshops they can run. Uh, and there's, they're offered out. We can run them and teach and do these things inside the library. And so again, it brings people from all over the campus into those collaborative learning centers that you saw Rick show pictures of a little bit earlier, and you get them sitting there working together on how do you do this. One of the other things we've done in the Edge is hooked up one of these units with an iPad so that we can go out and scan units. So if we don't find an image on the web that we need for a person to do what they're working with, we just stick an iPad in their hand, tell them to go find it, and scan it, and then bring it back in and load it on the system. Um, again, we remind them to stay within copyright, but in doing this, we've found them quite versatile. They'll go out and scan all kinds of stuff and bring it into the lab to work with. So this is our oval station, which we built and designed inside the library, and it's actually pretty, pretty clever. If you've worked with VR sets at all, you know once you put these things on, you're waving your hands around quite a bit, right? So if you're standing right next to somebody and you're waving your arms around, <laughs> bam, right, right, you can laugh. So what we did is build chairs that slide uh, right up to the PC, you fire up your virtual reality instance, get it going, and then you push back on the chair, and then you've got a defined space with which to work. So these are actually designed to be built in pods of four. Uh, this is a starting unit we started with, it's two, but these are now being put in all over the campus. Uh, and so these are really fascinating. So <coughs> it's called the Oval, it's the Oklahoma Virtual Academic Laboratory. Uh, and it involves a lot of software that we've uh, started developing on top of uh, the Unity software. It's gaming software underneath, but it's applied to education. It's network and an analysis. So what that means is that we can hook these units together on the web. And so we can have one setting here. Uh, we can have one setting in a lab across the campus. I'll show you some instances of this in a minute. And the instructor can actually be standing in their, in their office running these sessions. We can hook them all together. Because it's using the gaming software, it's made to do that from the beginning. And they can run the class pointing out to the student all the things they want them to see. You can remotely load 3D models. I mean, if you go out on the web, you can find a lot of 3D models floating around for you to work with, and that's great. But if you want to run them on the oval, then you've got to put it on a stick and bring it in. No, not really. All you have to do is load it up to our website. We give you a place to put it. And when you come in, it will already be setting on the menu for you, waiting for you to use it. So that's been very popular. Now, let's see if I can get this to run here. One of the problems with running this in this mode. Oh, it's not showing it. All right, there we go. talking about when we talk about the old goal is 360 degrees of interactive content. 
you can look in any direction and in that I'm sorry, I'm trying to get the volume up for you. Away from the old data from the inside. What the Oval platform does is that it provides that immersive environment where um, the students can, you know, look around. Um, and they can see details in their models, but you know, most importantly, they understand spatially what is actually going to be the impact. If you look at the hemoglobin molecule on a computer. It's not really uh, easily graspable, I mean, because oxygen is really hidden inside and the iron molecule is also hidden deep inside. So when you look at it through a VR, you can really dive into the iron molecule and oxygen molecule and realize where they are located at. So using the VR really helps the students understand what's happening to oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. It's just amazing using the Oval software for my classes because there's a difference between seeing these words written on a page and then seeing the objects they're talking about right in front of you there that you can interact with and look at and move around in real life. With the regular way that we look at manuscripts, we look at them on a screen, we're separated from them, we inhabit a different space, and we move them around with a mouse. Suddenly, if I can move into a space, inhabit that space with the manuscript, I can move within its top of pages and experience them with the grandeur that the manuscripts actually command when you're in their presence. Today, you can upload your 3D model or asset or data set to the library website, walk into the edge with your co-researcher or student or classmate, and you can fly through that data set and then export screenshots used for publication or presentation down the line. So you can see it's really cool stuff that's going on there and the professors get quite excited about it. The professor that uh, Dr. Anders who did the manuscripts had gone to Ireland and taken 70 photos of each page with different filters. We loaded all that in and combined it together and now you can actually fly right into the top of the page at such a close dimension that you can determine where the ink has flaked off the page. So now he can go back and say that should be this color, even though it's missing. He can now reconstruct the pages and tell us exactly what the page would have looked like originally. He could have never done that without this kind of tool in his hands. And he's so excited by it, as you can well tell in that video, he's thrilled with what we're now able to do for him. So uh, we're forming partnerships all over the campus. Uh, and uh, let me show you a few of these. College of Architecture, you saw them walking in that video through some of their models. Uh, that professor is wonderful. She was telling us the story about she used to take her architecture students down to a big empty parking lot on our research campus, get cardboard boxes, and have them build their, their housing models out of cardboard. And now they bring them off of the model that they design it on, stick it on our oval, sit down and walk through their buildings. And they're finding out, you know, the, they put a banister in the wrong place, or they they put an overhead beam in a place where it's smacking them in the head or all kinds of problems that they wouldn't have seen any other way. And they didn't have to go down to an empty parking lot and put it together with a bunch of cardboard. So she was so thrilled. She actually sent us a note saying, I'm sitting at my desk crying because this is so cool what I can now do. It's a wonderful message. So yeah, she's been a loyal supporter. They're now buying an oval to put in their own college. Uh, Kim and Biochem, you saw him talking about the, <coughs> the oxygen chemical at the middle. NASA, we've been talking with them quite a bit. They're very interested in putting in an oval in, in uh, their shop down in Florida. The English department, of course, Dr. Anders, uh, we were talking with him. Sam Noble History Museum on our campus uh, is planning on uh, doing an oval. Uh, College of Law is already in the process of installing an oval in the law. They're going to do crime scenes, what they're working on. So they'll be able to take people, uh, jurors, potentially in the future, and actually walk them through a crime scene and actually see it. Not have to look at photographs, but to actually be able to walk through and reconstruct the crime on a crime scene. And the College of Engineering is planning on it as well. Uh, they've got all kinds of ideas over there. So the Innovation Hub is also going to be a place that we're going to put one of these. And you haven't heard about the Innovation Hub, but this man's going to tell you about that. So the Innovation Hub, um, 
a space about two miles south of where the main library is down in our research park. We have the blessing of being relatively in close proximation. Uh, there's a variety of buildings down in, in this space, but for people on campus, psychologically, this is always too far. Two miles is too far. So we've had this question. We're real excited about the space. Um, this is initially on the uh, essentially what will be the ground floor here of this building. And uh, in the research park, about 20,000 square feet. It's been totally gutted and, and renovated. Um, and we're going to be, for the library piece of this, we're going to be taking staff that, again, matrix, that work in the edge, and part of their hours will also be down at the Innovation Hub. So one way to think about this is the edge, which we just saw, is sort of a window into this larger space, 20,000 square foot space, with very serious maker spaces, very large equipment, so you could get started in the edge and then Oh, we need to scale this up, take it down to the research park, and go from there. Again, open to everybody. Um, lots of different expertise uh, available. We have a learning, a collaborative learning space in this area. Um, so very much like what, what you'd heard about. But what I think is interesting for me about this space is it's not owned by anyone. It's co-owned by the OU Libraries, by the, our CIO for the university, uh, our vice president for research, the dean of the Price uh, Business College, the dean of the College of Engineering. So the five of us essentially are, uh, if you will, 20% owners, uh, and we are collectively figuring out a model about how this will be staffed, how it will be shared, and we have complementary services in this space. So for example, the library is not going to be running the very high-end maker space with the big saws and the very large printers and the metal works and all of that, but it's adjacent to the kind of space we're working with visualization. It's adjacent to the school of business which has a whole entrepreneurial program with students that, that are in and out of there all the time. So these things really start to become complementary and, and flow together. So the geographic dispersion. Um, We've got a two-mile zone here. We're located up in the center of campus, what was the center of campus, as is information technology. The VPR office, uh, research office, is down uh, another building adjacent to the building I just showed you. College of Business and the Engineering College are all up in the center of campus. So there's been a lot of talk about how do we get people to make this two-mile traversal, even though there's acres of parking, um, research facilities and, and so forth. We've got to find a, a way to, to do that. So part of what the EDGE does is it allows, again, back in the main library, it allows people to have a window into what's possible, to get drawn in, perhaps to have a class, to get excited enough, I'm ready to go to the next level. It's worth my energy to figure out how to traverse the two miles. What I'm, what I'm been dreaming of and, and talking with Carl, I literally want a high definition screen always on so that we can virtually have those two spaces connected all the time. No software intermediation, just stand up to a screen, life size, high definition signal um, to really have that very tightly coupled together. So the edge and the hub, two different locations um, interlinked. Uh, again, another view of the building. Um, the space the library has is in this area here, uh, engineering, and, and again, these things sort of flow together around a large corridor. So relative to what we're used to working with, um, a large amount of space compared to what we have available in the Bazell Library, it will get, get eaten up quickly. Our long-term plan is to occupy the entire building, all three floors, and to st start to induce the private sector to come into this innovation space with us as a place where they can begin to showcase some of their work. They've got access to our students. We've got surrounding the research park. We've got a variety of businesses that have sprung up. So we really think that this is going to be kind of a natural uh, point of synergy and, and right in the middle of what we want to be. So um, the opening is scheduled for May. Uh, space that when this photo was taken still being built out here some of the maker space we also have as a way to start to market this space and communicate what we're doing we said let's get a trailer and start driving it around the state and we'll take it to the state fair 
We'll take it to the high schools uh, for part of our recruitment process. We'll get the faculty in there to start to understand what's going on, etc. And so, can't do a lot in there, but it's the beginning of what is 3D printing, and again, what is a, you know, why would I want bench facilities and so forth. So this has become a great kind of marketing and advertising uh, way to get to get a dialogue going, which is part of what we've been trying to do over this this last year. So the big question, and I think really the CNI community question is, uh, well, that's cool. How do you how do you really scale this? And when I talk about scale and pose the problem, I'm really asking the question about how, how does a node in a large network of research organizations scale things up in a way that we can really start to interact with one another? So again, I'll, I'll pass this back to Carl and give him the tough question. <laughs> well, part of what you, you have to know, and I know he's not fond of the term makerspace, but it is the term that is widely used and gives us at least a handle on the growth that's going on in this area. So if you look at these charts, you can see these things are growing like crazy. They're, they're popping in all over the place. And if you look at the geographic location, it's across the entire United States that they're being put in. So these are very popular. Some of them are libraries, some of them are in other kinds of facilities, some are standalone, but they're popping up all over the place. So our thought is, all right, this is a typical day at the edge. Uh, not at all unusual to find it packed like this. And so we've got a scaling problem already. I mean, given the space we've got, and even with the innovation that's coming on, it's going to be two miles away. How are we going to scale these things? Well, part of what we've done is put up a website that really allows people to interact with an awful lot on our website. So if you go to the Innovation at the Edge website, uh, we, we are sharing code there. We've got our students working with us there. We've got our teams working off of the space. We've set up a GitHub site where we're sharing out some of the code we're working on and the things we're doing. And so this is all being done in support of uh, the Edge and the Oval and the Hub. And so these are working sites uh, where we bring a lot of people together. You can sign up for all the classes that I've mentioned so far at, at this website. And so that gets people started and underway. But we have lots of challenges. And so that's part of what we want to talk about in the scaling, right? So with space and equipment, they're difficult, but they're not impossible. You can always find space and equipment if you work at it hard enough. Uh, what gets more challenging is sharing the people the space, the expertise, and collaborating across wide geographic areas. We think we have an interesting sandbox at OU just because we've got one two miles from the other one. <coughs> and we've got them popping up, bits and pieces of, of the land popping up at other buildings on the campus. So how do we help it all together? Well, as I mentioned, we think we've got this good sandbox. Uh, we've got the Innovation Edge, we've got the Innovation Hub. They're both going to have oval stations in them, and we want to be able to set it up so the professor, instructor, and teacher can sit in this classroom or sit in his office and run a session. And we've done that. So that can actually be done today, and we already are having that happen. Um, and so there's no reason that we couldn't hook in other labs all around the countryside when we're running classes. And the same thing would be true of you. Using this kind of technology, if you're running classes, then we could tap into yours. And that way we can begin to share expertise and collaborate together in some really interesting and useful ways. This is what Rick was talking about a moment ago that I'm desperately searching for. Uh, he's described as saying this is what he wants, a, a virtual station where people can walk up and instantly talk to somebody who's in, at the hub from the edge. They want to be able to have a conversation. Okay, maybe it's the College of Engineering. Uh, the only place I can even remotely find some technology like this is on the Microsoft site, and it's not for sale yet. So if you all know of any place that actually has some technology like this, where you can walk up to it and start talking to somebody in a remote, let me know, because I'm trying to get this man off my back. Um, <laughs> all right, the other thing we've done to scale up our lab is to do a touchdown service using my team. Now, I've got one of the largest groups of employees uh, in the library. And I've asked all of them to take and spend four hours a month. I don't care whether they're a cataloger or a web designer. I don't care who they are. I've asked them to go to the edge and spend an hour a week at the edge. Why did they do that? Well, there were several things I was hoping to resolve. One, I'm trying to provide coverage. I just want to make sure we've got a warm body in there and we can kind of oversee the lab. 
But the other thing I was really hoping for was that they would learn about the new technologies themselves. How do you use 3D printing? How do you use virtual reality? How do you go to a microcontroller? How do you do software carpentry? And it's really been fascinating. I know Rick's had some conversations with my team members. Some of them are absolutely thrilled that they've been forced to do this. They weren't at the beginning, but they are now. They were actually quite enthusiastic because they're learning things about themselves. And some of the most positive remarks have been from some of the women who've actually signed up and taken the classes because they're immersing themselves in a highly technical environment and they're succeeding like crazy and they're feeling really good about it. It's a great thing to see happen. They also get a chance to interact with end users. Knowledge services is largely behind the scene at, the, at OU. Uh, we're not the public facing, for the most part, part of the organization. But this actually puts them out there where they're now interacting with end users, helping them learn how to use a 3D printer, showing them how to use virtual reality. And so that's been a really positive experience. Plus, when we couple it with the new technology, they're hearing new ideas emerge. So we've seen some really interesting opportunities come out of that. Um, and I'm hoping that they're going to find new opportunities that they're going to bring back to us and say, you know what, I heard this interesting idea. And then we can follow up on it, and we often do. We advertise their skills on a whiteboard in the lab, and we also are starting to market them out ahead of time. These people all have skills, metadata skills. Of course, a lot of these people are catalogers. Web designing, if they want to build a website. So when we post their time that they're going to be in the lab, we also post what are their primary skill sets. And then people can sign up to come and talk to them about that part of what they do. Not just what's happening in the edge, but I got a website I'm trying to build. Or I've got to come up with some metadata description for this object, I need help. And these people are now interacting directly with those users in their field of expertise. So that's been pretty cool. We've also had a really interesting thing start to happen where the lab has actually caused a reversal of roles almost. We have found out that we're learning from the students as much as they're learning from us. So here was an interesting example. We had a 3D printer breakdown. If you work with 3D printers, you know they break down all the time, right? At least once a week. So, you know, we got four of them, and we're running them all continually, but we had one breakdown. Our guys, on our staff looked at it. They tried to fix it. They couldn't do it. We had a student walk in. He looked at it for a little bit, and he said, you know, I think I can fix it. And then he did something really bright. He printed the part that was broken on another print. And then put it We're going, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so, you see this role reversal going on. We had another student walk in and say, you know, I just automated my house using the Amazon Echo. Would you like me to teach a class on how to do that? And we were like, yeah, so do it, you know. And so this started this trend where we have got students not only teaching classes, but volunteering to staff the lab, they're thrilled to be in there. This is their technology. They understand it. It's gaming software. It's 3D printers. And so we're actually, in many instances, becoming the students, and they're becoming the instructors. And it's really cool. So we came up with an idea to try and recognize them. So I've set up three levels of community memberships. So a community member is just somebody, we award them a certificate, uh, but basically, they're people that volunteer to help run the lab. And we, we're setting up a digital badge for them to put on their LinkedIn. Uh, we'll keep them on the website and list them as a community member. And when they move past OU, uh, we'll graduate or whatever, we're going to put them on a past support page on the website. If you go up a level, we have what we call a community builder. Community Builder is someone, we've taken the software carpentry course in pedagogy, and one of my digital scholarship specialists has condensed that down to a two-hour course. Now, you don't get software carpentry certification for it, but we'll teach you how to teach, so that if you're going to run classes in the lab, you have some idea of what you should be doing and how to teach it. Again, we do the same kind of thing. We have more of a certificate from the website, all those same ideas. But what they've done is taken a pedagogy course, and they are now, in our mind, certified to teach uh, on a regular basis. And then we've got community leaders. And the community leaders are those people that we know we can call on to do demos. Uh, 
frequently when we have surprise guests who want to have a tour of the edge, uh, I call on one of our volunteers because, again, they know that equipment really well. And they're happy to do it. Uh, and again, we, we ask them to take a course in pedagogy and the next layer is that they train other students in how to do uh, demos and all of that. So we're building these layers, giving them certificates, gift cert Our IT store on campus gave us a stack of $25 gift certificates. We hand them out for people to t either take courses, teach courses, uh, do these awards. Uh, it's great. We've got great support on the campus. We also have just, this one we haven't done yet, but it's all planned and it's going to happen. One of the things we're trying to do with all these volunteers is give them a pathway to a job. They all have jobs, right? They're volunteering. Uh, <laughs> they want to get paid for this. So what we've done is part of our software carpentry courses, we've actually now set up a social at the very front of it, a lunch social, and we use the software carpentry workshop. And what we do is offer pizza and drinks. We have researchers come in on the campus that are willing to come and talk about what are your research projects? What are your needs? What problems are you having? Where could you use some help? And they get up and do that. And then we have the volunteers get up and talk about what they've been doing in the edge or the hub. What are they learning, preparing, and doing? And so again, we try and create this intersection where we're hoping the researchers, and we don't promise anybody anything, but we just say, hey, you all need to be aware of each other, because we think there's some interesting possibilities here. And so the researchers can hire them just to knock off a specific task if they do it well. Maybe they take them on to do some other thing. Plus, it couples the students then with researchers in a very meaningful way, and they get to experience research at a much higher level than they would normally. So I, we think it's going to be interesting. We haven't really fully tested this idea out, but we're moving forward. Um, if, if it all works out, well, then that's another reason for other volunteers to want to work in the edge or the hub. The other thing we've got going right now is we've applied for a night news challenge. We've uh, got an engineering student who really loves the edge and wants to, he's about to graduate. Um, when he graduates, he wants to work in the library. But he, he would love to work in the edge. He would like to bring his engineering skills and put him to work in the edge. So we applied to the Knight Foundation and said, hey, we got an idea. We want to put an engineer in our lab and make him available. I mean, we've got a college of engineering that wants to put in a mobile, they want to do all kinds of things. Well, you can bring it. have that kind of expertise right here on the edge. And if, again, other universities would do the same kind of thing, then we can start to come all together. We can network them together in ways that will allow us, either webinars, Skype, whatever, um, to offer consultation, advice, teach courses together. That's how I hope we can all start leveraging off of each other in ways that are very collaborative, very cooperative. So shared expertise, uh, if we can do that, we leverage, we move forward in some really, really neat ways. Okay. One of the things we really are dealing with at the, at the library right now that's quite challenging, though, is we're creating a whole lot of new types of content and data. Virtual reality, we're bringing in research data sets, we transform that in order to display it on the VR sets. Well, that whole transformation process then has to be documented, exactly what happened, how do we document it, how do we record that documentation so it can be part of the publication research process. Lots of challenges there. We've got to capture all this data. Once we've built these VR sets of, of images, we have to store them away somewhere. Uh, we've got to organize, put the metadata on them, make them accessible so others can find them. There's no reason I should make them accessible to all of you to use if they would fit your workers' needs. And again, I'm hoping you'll do the same thing in reverse. We've got to network all this stuff together. Now, maybe that's using existing repository structures. Maybe we, we have to do something new there. We're not quite sure. I think there's a clear need for some standardization that doesn't exist yet today. So we're going to have to work on trying to start standardizing a lot of this stuff. And then that will facilitate the sharing. Uh, of course, we want to federate it all together so as to improve the access and findability of it all. Uh, and long-term preservation and archiving. I, I was at the Preservation Archiving Conference in uh, Prague a few weeks back, and I pointed out to people, we've done a whole lot of work with VR, but a lot of it's sitting in the cloud. Unity software 
hooks up to a, a Unity application running in the cloud. How do we preserve that? We don't have a copy of what's running in that Unity server back home in their cloud, and they aren't going to give it to us. And so we don't know what the network's going to look like in five or ten years. So even if I captured the data set and I've got this great image file, how are we going to replay it five years from now to show what we did and how we're moving forward? We've got Oculus Rift. Uh, we're all running on development kits right now. The new ones just came out. We'll all be buying them shortly, I'm sure. Where do we put all this stuff that we did with the development kit? This probably is going to be significantly enhanced in the new one. We've got a lot of stuff that we already need to start capturing to document the history of virtual reality, which I think is here to stay and taking off. A lot of work for us to do there, and we're going to have to do it collaboratively. So the question is, of course, how are we going to do that? And one of the things that we're trying right now um, is to we work with the console library and information resources, and we've created a postdoc position that will be focused on this. And so right now, uh, we're interviewing candidates for this job, and we're going to hire somebody and bring them in for two years and focus them on how do we take research data, how do we couple it with virtual reality, how do we preserve all this? How, what's the infrastructure we need to build in order to make that possible? And start putting that framework together. I'm sure in two years we won't be able to flesh it all out, but we'll get a good one to start, we hope. Uh, so that's what we're doing as a starting, starting point on, on that part of it. <coughs> Okay, one of the questions that we knew people were going to ask when we did this presentation was, how much money have you spent doing all of this? Wow, it looks like you've blown a whole bunch of money here, right? Well, actually, not as much as you think. Innovation at the Edge, which we uh, put together for $49,000, and we did it in three and a half months. We took a room in the library, it was a staff room, uh, had windows facing the main aisle and the, on the main level of the library, and uh, we convinced the students that they wanted to go to another spot, and we took that over, we repainted it, uh, we put in some signage, we moved in all that equipment, we built those virtual reality stations, and that's what we spent. Now that's our staff time, but that's our actual out-of-pocket cost so far. So that's not bad. Now, the innovation at the hub, yeah, a little more expensive. Uh, <laughs> oh, he tells me it's five million. I ask. No, five, I, five minutes. Oh, five minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a big cost over actually. All right, anyways. <laughs> that's been underway for two years and two months. I know I've been whispering since I got to, to uh, OU in Rexier, we need this kind of facility. Um, and it took a while to get traction, and then it got assigned to the right person who made it happen. So that was great. Okay. Um, <coughs> lessons learned. What have we learned? Well, library team. No, and I'm sure you all experience this all the time, you will have cave members. Colleagues against virtually everything. <laughs> they're going to be out there, they're going to be saying, this is a waste of money, time, you're taking things away. We need journals, what are you doing? Um, no, it's coming, but you really can make a very strong case on how important this is. When you watch the kids collaborating in the collaborative spaces, this is a natural extension. They want to take the ideas that they're talking about and then physically express them or virtually express them. And a lot of the innovators on campus are doing this. I can't tell you how many kids we've had build a mock-up of a device they think they can sell. And some of them started companies, and they've actually selling off the websites, uh, GoPro camera holders, uh, just some of the weirdest things you'd ever think. But wow, when you look at it, it's like, that's really cool. Did you do that by yourself? And they, yeah, it's great. Uh, there are other members who will embrace it, and they, they are great, because they help you support it and get it off the ground. Uh, really, you have to prepare your team to communicate it out to the campus. This may be a place I don't think we did this as well as we could have, but making sure, for instance, all your subject liaisons know what you're doing and why you're doing it and get them out there marketing it. Uh, I was in, uh, we had one, one professor walk into our edge and we gave her a tour and she was like, do you know how I found out about this? No, please tell me. She was standing in line at the grocery store over at the Memorial Union buying lunch and hearing the student ahead of her telling uh, his girlfriend that he was going to a class at the, at the library to learn how to do 3D printing. She's like, I want to know how to 
And so it's important, it's at the library. But you know, the question Rick and I both asked when we came back was, why isn't there subject readers on time? You know? And so that's a problem. We can't always assume they're gonna do that unless we really arm them well and push them out there and say, please, please go tell all the faculty about what we're doing. There. We also have to convince them to embrace the opportunities. A lot of people will come to you with ideas. Uh, we've got a, a little groundswell of ideas coming at us. But you have to learn to embrace those, try and show them what's possible. We're not trying to get in a service role here. We're really trying to teach faculty how to use this technology and put it at their fingertips and then step away and let them go. We want to encourage the use of the space. So you don't want to put barriers in the way. A lot of times when I'm watching maker spaces, I watch a lot of libraries put some pretty tight barriers. You gotta pay for the material, you gotta pay for this, you got certain times you we try and avoid that. We've really taken an open approach. Come on in, we use the, the lowest cost filaments that don't have any odor and no obnoxious um, you know, uh, fumes in order to make it all very accessible. <clears throat> We need to encourage everybody to work together in these labs. And so we've seen a lot of that that's gone well for us, but it's really important. Don't forget to get them all together and explain why you're doing this and how you're doing it. Remember to design scaling them from the beginning. I think that's one thing we've done particularly well. When we started putting these platforms together, we were always keeping in mind we could connect them together and we could do that. And the 3D printing and how we've laid out the hub and the edge the edge, the name, came from the hub, right? The hub was processed long before we started the edge, so we were trying to build the connection in people's brain. That's the main hub where you go to do this stuff. This is the edge. You come out here and we'll get you started, we'll help build the community, but we're gonna push you towards the hub. So even in the naming, we've tried to support the need to scale. And then of course you gotta share ideas widely and far uh, failures, what worked, what didn't work. Uh, we've just done that here in this room in the last hour. Collaborate, <laughs> collaborate, collaborate. Um, it's the only way to go. So you're here, I think that was a, a good example of us all trying to work together, but don't hesitate to share back uh, what you come up with and ways that we can build off of each other. So that's the end. Um, and we can take some Q&A right there, and there's the man who really helped us get the Innovation Hub off, off the uh, ground at OU. Okay, Q&A. So thanks very much for your interest today.